don't know what they do. They don't look like they kill us right away. But what effect do they have 20 years later? And something that doesn't go away can bioaccumulate. Things add up. Our cells can't handle those kinds of things. But if it isn't at above a threshold, you don't find out about it until it's too late. We know that a fetus is very sensitive to even subtle changes in hormone concentrations. So the question then becomes, do these endocrine disruptors that we're exposed to, and many of them have been measured in breast milk and in other tissues of, of the pregnant female, for example, are these enough to maybe tweak slightly the fetal and embryonic development of a baby still in the womb or in the first couple of years of their life after birth? Um, things that change the hormones at a, at a very critical stage. So maybe just right in the two weeks that you're developing as a baby or, or you're in gestation, these chemicals can have huge effects on us. Estrogen is rather reactive um, as a signaling molecule throughout the body in a number of different pathways, um, specifically, especially in embryo development early stages it can have very um, large effects and rather damaging in some cases. A number of the cases from, from the past where we've had chemicals that were used in pregnant women that were later found out to have very serious side effects causing a number of birth defects mimicked the actions of estrogen. Some reproductive cancers that are much more common today than they were 50 years ago also have been linked to endocrine disruption. What has been hypothesized in many studies is that, is that some of the degradation and some of the changes in the reproductive potential and timing in humans may be related to endocrine disruptors. One example is that in the Western Hemisphere, uh, puberty in, in girls has set on earlier and earlier. It used to be two to three years later than we find it today statistically. More estrogens in a young male, developing male, could reduce sperm production based on animal models and could also demasculinize a male, for example, change or delay the onset of uh, pubic hair growth and those kind of things, the kind of secondary sexual characters we usually associate with masculine forms versus feminine forms. Because, because some of these compounds have effects on the estrogen system, um, I think that can be related, or it can be looked at, the relationship needs to be looked at between that and the decrease in male sperm counts over the last 50 years. Male sperm count worldwide seems to have gone down by about 50% in the last 50 years. Um, the joke is you're not the man your grandfather was. animal studies it has been shown that endocrine disruptors can cause such a decline in sperm density. Very definitely we see feminization of the world. And something's happening out there. Something's clearly happening out there. And I don't think it's that we're just better at looking at things. The problem with pharmaceuticals and hormones and endocrine disrupting compounds is it's a very difficult problem to study and it's a very new problem. So we haven't been studying it for very long. The concentrations are extremely low, um, really at the border of the concentrations that we can actually detect them with our analytical chemistry. And then to actually do scientifically valid experiments to prove that such and such a compound causes such and such an effect is extremely difficult, especially when you consider that the environment is a complicated, uh, basically, laboratory of multiple chemicals with poorly controlled conditions. Temperatures are always changing. Flow rates of water is always changing. And so it becomes a very convoluted, difficult problem to address scientifically. We see increasing cancer rates, we see feminization of organisms, we see things which we can certainly blame, or think we can blame, on things like endocrine disruptive chemicals. And if that were the case, then we better figure out a way to get them out of the water supply.